So hi, uh, I'm Simon Willison and I'm going to be talking to you about a proposal for a new default web stack for Python web applications. So I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm currently the Director of Architecture at Eventbrite, so I run a small architecture team there where we look at um, making sure that our code base is going, going to be able to scale and handle the future complexity and, and traffic challenges that the, that the site has. Uh, previously I was co-founder and CEO of Lanyard, a uh, startup which was acquired by Eventbrite last year. So um, this gives me quite, an quite, quite a fun perspective on this stuff because these are two very different projects. Lanyard is something that started four years ago as a side project um, sort of Greenfield's, Greenfield's development got to build it in whatever we liked. Uh, we grew a team around it over time. Uh, Eventbrite is a very different kind of platform. Eventbrite's code base is over seven years old. It's had over 100 engineers who've touched the code at different times. It's evolved through various stages where it started as a custom homegrown Python framework, then switched over to Django, had unit tests added and so on. But it also handled over a billion dollars of ticket sales last year. So it's operating on a, in, on a completely different scale. Um, and some of the things I'm talking, all of the technology I'm talking about today, uh, we, we've used on both projects. In fact, completely independently. When I when I got to Eventbrite, I was quite um, surprised to see how much of the stuff we'd been using at Lanyard was was applicable at the at Eventbrite scale as well. Um, I should warn you, I'm something of an architectural magpie. I really love digging into new tools and trying out new things. And um, it's very easy for me to get carried away with all of this. Uh, um, when, after I hired a couple of engineers at Lanyard, one of the things they in introduced was a rule saying uh, we're not allowed to add any piece of technology to the stack without first removing a piece of technology as well. Um, which actually, that's, it turns out that's a fantastic rule. We're, we're, we're doing the same kind of thing at Eventbrite now as well. Um, but what I've tried to sort of rein myself in and look at just the technologies which haven't turned out to be a bad idea several years down the line. Um, so a few years ago, if you were building a website, it was the, the choice of what, what to build it with was really simple. You had a web server with PHP or Python or Ruby or whatever on it, and you had a database, and those two things were enough to build anything you might want to build. If you wanted to be really snazzy, you could add memcache as well and, and have a bit of, of, of in-memory caching going on to speed things up. Uh, the scene these days is, is massively different. This is a massively simplified version of the Lanyard architectural diagram um, showing a whole host of different technologies that are all coming together. And um, the theory I want to put forward today is that while you don't need all of this stuff for, for, any, for a project that you're starting, there are a bunch of technologies beyond that default of a web server and a database that it's worth getting involved in your project very early on indeed, because those, pro th those technologies give you additional capabilities and help you build, build software faster and um, iterate quicker and generally avoid some of the pitfalls of, um, of, of web application development. So our goal here is to pick a stack that provides us with platform capabilities that make features cheaper to build. And when I say platform capabilities, I'm really talking about you know, things that make a big difference and enable you to go after bigger, bigger goals and bigger features. Um, a lot of the stuff I want to talk about today, if you've got it in your stack, there are features that suddenly become easy, whereas previously you'd have thought, well, you know, that's going to be several months of work. I don't know if that'll be worthwhile. If you can drop that down to a few days of work, then you can greatly expand the scope of your project and you can be a lot more ambitious in what you're trying to build. At Lanyard, um, the, 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 the engineering team was, the, the largest it ever was was six people, but we always tried very much to punch above our weight because we knew that when you're running a startup and you've got all sorts of, that there's all sorts of competition, all sorts of fronts, it's important to be able to make the most of the engineering um, resources that you have. So the first technology I want to add to this sort of fantasy football um, dream stack is uh, something to solve the search problem. And when I talk about search, the important thing to realize is that a search engine isn't something that just handles text queries. You know, this, this is not just about being able to give somebody a text box and let them type something in. And so I'll show you a couple of examples of things that we built at Lanyard using a search engine that are maybe a, a little um, unconventional. Um, just one second. There we go. So Lanyard is built, Lanyard uses uh, Solar. Uh, as our full text search engine. We actually had it running on the site from, from 
um, from the day we launched. But there are a bunch of things we did with it that um, take advantage of other things that search engines are good at. In fact, one of the key features on the site is an example of that. This is our suggested events page. And what this is doing is saying, OK, I know that you're Simon Willison. I know who you follow on Twitter and so on. These are events that I think are relevant to you based on based on what I know about you. So today it's pointing me at EuroPython, because I've got two friends who are speaking there. Um, it's got a startup school Europe. I've got a friend speaking there. It turns out it's a busy weekend for conferences. And here's Pi Ohio as well. And some of these events are because my friends are speaking at them. Some of them are because then things like a guide. I've subscribed to the London Hack Days guide, and so that event's showing up here. And I can scroll down. And, and see all sorts of other stuff going on around the world. Now, this page is actually generated by a search query. Well, what we do is we search for upcoming events um, that match a whole host of different criteria. So it might be that they match my topic subscriptions. This is a Django event, and I, I've asked to see all of the Django events. Or, or, we, or it might be that they intersect with the list of people I'm following on the site. And because Solar is um, horizontally scalable, you can replicate your Solar instance into, onto, into mul multiple copies and then load balance the searches across it. This actually scales surprisingly well. We always assumed when we built this that we'd hit a point when it wasn't going to work anymore. But it turns out because um, the data set that you're dealing with, which is just events that haven't happened yet, is, is, is naturally limited, this actually works surprisingly well. A related feature we've built with Search, this is our coverage directory. So Lanyard allows people to gather links to slides and videos and notes from conference talks. And I'll be putting my slides up on, up on the site at the end of this talk. Um, and so this feature here shows all of the, shows all of the slides, audio clips, write-ups, the whole lot. And you can search it, um, but you can also see the most recently uploaded. But then down the side, we have these um, filters. Uh, in search terminology, these are called facets. And these, will tell, these tell you that if you ask for just the coverage about Python, you'll get 937 results. If you ask for coverage, which is Python videos, you'll get 518 videos. Um, and this is the kind, this, this query being able to say, OK, well, for individual properties, how many results would there be, is viciously expensive to do using a SQL database. But full text search engines like uh, Solar and Elasticsearch are uh, optimized for exactly this kind of query. It's essentially another form of um, set intersection across their across the, um, the data sets they build up. So, it may, so building these sort of faceted um, uh, browse interfaces is incredibly easy if you've, got a, if you've got all of your data loaded into a search engine. And what we realized is that this actually means that a search engine becomes a really interesting way of denormalizing your data. Uh, if you talk to anyone about building massively scalable websites, they'll tell you that, it's, uh, that while initially you want to make sure that you've got a beautiful, pristine data model in your relational database, at some point you're going to have to start denormalizing it and adding duplicates of the data to help you answer queries more efficiently. At Lanyard, we managed to avoid um, denormalizing in our core um, relational database by, by moving a lot of those queries out to other forms of storage. So in this case, we're using Solar as a denormalized collection of records and um, firing various queries that work better, work, work better against that, uh, against a search index at that instead of at our core database. And again, because we can replicate that, it, that those kinds of queries can be scaled independently of everything else. It also means that um, the, the work that we've put into keeping our search index up to date, making sure that when something changes on the main site, it's reflected in that search engine within normally 60 to 120 seconds, um, also feeds into those denormalizations. Um, there are really two main contenders these days for, for open source search servers, and those are um, Solar and Elasticsearch. Now, both of these are open source. They're both Java. They're both a, they both give you a HTTP server that you can talk to with gets and posts and send JSON documents to. And they're both built on top of the Lucene li library, which is currently the, I, I, it's the, the, the cutting edge um, open source search library. It's, uh, used for research by universities and things as well. Um, the, difference, the difference is that Solar is pretty, it's, it's pretty mature now. It's been around for nearly 10 years. 
and um, in fact, it might, might, might be longer than 10 years. And it's kind of dull, you know, it um, hasn't changed much. It's still quite driven by XML configuration files. It does at least speak JSON, although that was a, a sort of later edition. It's, it's more comfortable with you posting XML documents to it. But it is incredibly robust and battle-tested. Battle I've never written, run into a problem with Solar um, which has been down to immaturity of the software. Elasticsearch is a lot more exciting. It's only, been, it's only a few years old now, um, and it's kind of what you'd expect Solar to look like if someone was to design Solar from scratch today. So it speaks JSON by default. It's clustered out of the box, so it expects to be running on multiple nodes and automatically balancing documents um, backwards and forwards. And that's all great, except that last time I tried it a couple of years ago, it um, worked, for, worked for a couple of weeks and then locked up and corrupted my index and, and, and collapsed. Now, I've got um, I have friends who work for Elasticsearch now who assure me that those bugs have been fixed. But um, one of the... Um, and, and in fact, every day you see more and more companies like uh, companies like GitHub switching over to using Elasticsearch. At Lanyard, we had um, one philosophy that Tom Insom, our um, CTO, had is that you should never be the largest user of a piece of technology because if you are, you're inevitably going to be the, pers uh, the, the team that discovers all of the bugs in it. And I think these a few years ago it was possible to be the largest user of Elasticsearch. These days it's probably safe, um, but I've, I've been burned by it enough to, to stick with Solar for the moment. Um, now, no matter what you're using, if you're using Elasticsearch or Solar or even um, Zapien or Woosh, the pure Python search index, um, there's a fantastic uh, Django library that you can use to talk to them. Uh, it's called Django Haystack because um, of finding a needle in a haystack. And it's kind of like the Django ORM in that it's a, a single API that can be attached to multiple backends. So it can be plugged into Solar or Elasticsearch or Woosh, and I, whichever search engine you're using, you get a common interface over the top. And Haystack all, never ceases to surprise me. It, it, when, when I started using it, it felt like something that could get you up and running very quickly with Django site and search, but you'd eventually outgrow. And four years later, we were beginning to stretch the seams of what you can achieve with Haystack on Lanyard. But fundamentally, it was still working out really well for most of our use cases. Um, I've got one, one quick code sample to show you how straightforward Haystack makes adding search to a Django project. Um, you can define these index classes, uh, you set up the fields that you want to be fed into the search engine. So we've got a text field, an author field, and a pub date. And you set up a couple of methods that know how to, um, how to load stuff out of the database. So the index query set is the Django ORM models that you want to reflect in your search engine. In this case, we're saying we only want to index things that have a publication date less than today. So we're not indicating stuff that's been dated to go live in the future. And... Um, with just a few lines of code and a couple of, um, uh, a couple of command line things, you can um, generate a schema for Solar, you can, populate, you can populate your entire database, makes it very easy to do incremental updates as well. So whatever search engine you're using, I, I strongly suggest having a look at Haystack as a way of, of bootstrapping on it. Now, if you were here for the previous talk, uh, you'd have heard all about Celery, so I won't go into too much detail about it today. But I think a fundamental capability needed by any interesting web application is the ability to have offline tasks, to have something happen in the background without, block, without the user having to sit there with their browser spinning, waiting for it to, waiting for it to come up with a result. Um, in the Python world, we have Celery, which, again, it, you can take a surprisingly long way. It's, um, it makes it very easy to get started, and it scales up extremely well. We, we use Celery at Eventbrite. We used it for all sorts of things at Lanyard. And I know it's, it's used at a lot of um, um, even larger shops than that as well. And there are all sorts of things that you can do when you've got the ability to do, do offline task processing. And more importantly, these are all things which, if you haven't got this set up, you'd be tempted to do just, just in, in, in line inside your Python processes, um, which means they will be, they're the first things that are going to break when you start getting even a small amount of traffic. So these are things like um, doing image resizing and thumbnailing, anything where you fetch a URL from somewhere else on the internet. Um, it turns out there are an enormous quantity of, um, of, of failure cases for URLs. So even something as simple as, um, as like pulling an RSS feed or 
uh, or interacting with Facebook's API, has all, th there's always a chance that you'll have, that the server on the other end will stop responding, or it'll hang, or it'll be running really slowly, and that can um, pull down the performance of your entire application. So anything where you're doing URL fetches externally, it's worth, um, it's worth pushing through a queue. Uh, sending emails has much the same kind of problem, especially if you're sending lots of them. Um, also, these denormalizations, things like updating your solar index when something has changed, um, pushing those into a celery queue means that you can fire and forget and not have to worry about them. Uh, something we do at Lanyard is we use um, Celery for push notifications, sending them out to iPhone and Android devices. And again, I can show you a very simple code example here that illustrates how easy this stuff gets once you've got uh, an API like Celery in there. So this is our user push task. Um, given a user and some arguments, it loads that user from the database. It checks that we have a push notification token so that you know, it checks that they've approved their iPhone for receiving push notifications. And if they have, we do a token.push, token .push, which is actually quite a ex potentially expensive operation. It's talking to either the Google, Google's um, Android push uh, notification infrastructure or it's talking to, to Apple. But there's, um, there's always the, the worry that, that something there will take longer than expected. And then once you've got that set up, in our actual application code, we can just call that function with dot .delay on the end. Um, that's the magic property that's, in, that's set up by the task decorator up at the top. And we can send it a bunch of arguments that get passed on to that. So again, because we had this in the stack, whenever we were thinking in terms of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we sent a push notification here? We could just do it. We didn't have to worry about performance overhead. We didn't have to worry about any of the other implications of that because all of this stuff was already in place. Um, another tool, and I'm sure, I, I, I hope everyone in this room has, is, is familiar with how great this thing is, is Redis. Um, Redis is interesting to me in that it doesn't really have a category. Most other software you can say, well, you can use MySQL or, or um, Postgres, or you can use Solar or Elasticsearch, but Redis lives in its own weird little niche, of, uh, it's, and it's kind, of a, um, it's kind of a Swiss army knife. There's a ton of really interesting things that you can do when you uh, do with Redis. Um, if you haven't used it yet, used it before, Redis is essentially an in-memory data structure server. So it's kind of like memcached in that it runs in memory and you talk to it over a, over a network socket. But unlike memcached, it's persistent. It, has a, it, it writes stuff to, to, to disk as it goes. And it has a huge array of data structures and um, algorithms in it. So memcached can just store keys and values. Redis can store keys and values. It can store sorted sets. It can store lists of things. Um, it can, and it can do all of this stuff uh, at, at incredible rates of speed. I've uh, read this out of the box on your laptop will probably do 50,000 operations a second. So there's a whole class of things where previously you'd have needed dozens of servers and some really heavy duty scaling tech, and now you can just run one server with Redis and, and solve a whole bunch of, of interesting problems. So here are just a few of the things I've used Redis for in the past. Uh, at Lanyard, we use Redis as our Celery backend. So we use it as a lightweight in-memory queue for handing jobs off to, um, to workers. Uh, at Eventbrite, we use RabbitMQ, which is significantly more complicated, but does have, uh, it, it has better options for persistence and for failover and so forth. Um, one thing I've used Redis for extensively in the past is random features. So if, you, if you've ever built something where you have a front page that shows three random stories from the past year or, or, or anything like that, building those against a relational database is almost always a bad idea because you, you end up doing a sort by rand, which can quickly quickly bring a, bring a database server to its knees. Um, srand member is a Redis function that lets you do random item generation again at, 50, 000, at a rate of 50,000 hits a second. Um, you can use Redis sorted sets for things like scoreboards and most popular features. Um, you can use Redis lists as inboxes for activity streams. This is actually one of the most interesting use cases I've seen for Redis. This is um, interfaces like um, sites like Twitter, where I, I go to Twitter and I see a stream of everything that my friends are doing, which if you try and build that just against a, a relational database, will we'll just, it just won't work. Um, databases aren't, aren't meant to handle that kind of 
that kind of uh, variety of traffic. But actually what Twitter and a bunch of other sites do now is they maintain a Redis list for every user. And when, when, when one of your friends tweets, they make sure that that tweet ID ends up added to your Redis inbox. So I believe Twitter are the second largest Redis cluster in the world now because they're using it to power all of these different in inboxes. Um, Redis has uh, support for set intersections and set memberships. This is something we use quite extensively on Lanyard. We have a feature on Lanyard where if you go to an event page, so if I go to the PyOhio page, it'll show me everyone that it knows is going to that event, and it'll show me the subset of those people who are my friends, who are my contacts on Twitter. And the way we do that is we do a, Reddits, a, a Redis set intersection where we say, just give me back the IDs that are in the people I follow on Twitter list and in the... Um, in the people who are attending Pi Ohio list. And so again, it turns something that could be quite an expensive database call into essentially a free operation. And then um, of last year, uh, the last year Redis added a feature for supporting uh, text-based autocomplete as well, which is another one of those things that if you're building it, you want it to be screamingly fast. And finally, there are some, there's a, some really interesting things you can do using Redis scripting. Redis allows you to, run, to write um, scripts that run inside the s server um, use, using the Lua scripting language. And those scripts, it's kind of almost like a stored procedure in a database. They can read keys, write other keys, move things around. So there are all sorts of very interesting things you can do using Lua scripting, again, with crazy high performance, because it's all running in memory um, in, in optimized C, and, and I think they use Lua JIT to, to get the uh, Lua code running fast. So at Eventbrite, we actually use that as part of our ticket allocation mechanisms. Uh, when you're running a ticketing, uh, a ticketing provider, the most, important problem, the, the most important problem to solve is not selling the same ticket to two different people. And so our reserved seating environment, which, um, uh, our, which allows you to buy individual seats, like seat A1 in section 5, uses uh, Redis Lua scripting as part of the, the allocation logic. So, like I said, I'm an enormous fan of Redis. I've, I'm constantly finding new and interesting things I can do with it. Uh, another piece of software that I've, again, come to lean on quite a lot, and I kind of feel makes, uh, gets more valuable the earlier you put it in the stack, is Varnish. Now, Varnish is, it's another, it's another caching uh, technology. Varnish is a caching proxy service. The idea is that you, put, you run Varnish and you stick it in front of the rest of your web application. It caches entire HTTP responses, and when a request comes in, Varnish makes the decision if it should just serve the cached version of, or if it should pass it through to your underlying web application. And the difference in performance that can make is, is incredible. If you've got a web application that can handle 50 requests a second, if you stick Varnish in front of it, it'll, Varnish will be able to serve 50,000 requests a second. So again, we, we live in this wonderful era where it used to take serious money and serious hardware to handle a uh, uh, handle a, a high amount of traffic. Today, if you're running a cheap, uh, like $5 a month VPS and you put Varnish on there, you, can hand, um, you want your blog to handle being linked to from, from TechCrunch or, 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 or so forth. You can do that right now using, using open source technology. Um, the downside of Varnish is that it's quite complicated and it requires you to master a particularly obscure domain-specific language in order to really get any use of it out of at all. This is um, an example. I, I pulled this out of uh, Lanyard's Varnish config and then deleted 90% of it just to get it to fit on the slide. Um, Varnish's language is called uh, VCL, the Varnish Configuration Language. And it's got... Yeah, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's, it's reasonably okay. I'll, I can um, talk, through very, uh, talk through what some of this is doing. So this is essentially saying when a request comes in, in the VCL regv for request has been received, um, firstly, we don't do any caching if it's not a get or it's not a head request. So we only cache on, on get and head requests. Um, if the URL ends in .ics, um, Lanyard serves a lot of iCal files. You can subscribe to an iCal um, feed of Python events or Django events or events in London or the PyOhio schedule, all sorts of things. And those get, tend to get polled quite aggressively by um, calendar software. So we want to make sure that those are served, served through our Varnish cache. Um, what we're doing here is we're saying, if it's an iCal file, 
just ignore any of the user's cookies. Normally when you're when normally when you're caching things, it's very important not it's very important to take cookies into account because the last thing you want is for somebody to hit your website and see con private content intended for somebody else because um, because the the cache ignored the cookies and served you served you stale content. But this is saying that for iCal files we don't care about cookies at all. We'll just serve the safe, same thing no matter what, co what cookies people have. The next line is saying, um, if the user does have a cookie and it matches any of the cookies that we know are customization cookies for, for our site, um, don't cache at all. Just pass it straight through. Then down here we have the VCL fetch um, subroutine. Annoyingly, even though Varnish VCL has subroutines, you're only allowed three. You're allowed VCL rec, VCL fetch, and VCL hash, and you can't define your own, which um, which gets gets pretty frustrating. Um, so this one is essentially that the most interesting part here is down at the bottom where I was saying, if we've got all the way through here, so none of the rules saying we shouldn't cache this apply. If the page that we've pulled from the back end um, either isn't, isn't set to be cached at all, uh, cached, or is set to be cached for less than 60 seconds, bump it up to 60 seconds. And this is a technique um, that I recently found out is called micro-caching. The idea here is that if a user's logged out of your site and they hit your page, why not just, 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 serve, it, why not just serve everything out of a one-minute long cache? A minute's not a long, very long time, but it does mean that if you get a surprise, um, a surprise spike in traffic, if somebody with a million Twitter followers uh, links, to, links to your page, or if you end up on the front page of a, of a popular tech blog, and these are both things that happened to Lanyard before we'd put this line in and, and, to, and caused us all sorts of problems. Um, if you get that sudden spike of traffic, because all of those users are signed out, because they're just people who are showing up anonymously for the first time, you can serve the whole lot out of the cache. And it means that those 10,000, 100,000 hits from, from, um, from, from Twitter turn into one hit every 60 seconds to your back end. So that, those sort of three lines of VCL on their own can keep your site up in the face of pretty much any unexpected surge of anonymous traffic. Now, the next te technique I want to talk about isn't so much, um, it's not really, uh, it's not so much a piece of infrastructure, it's more of a code level technique, but it's something which, again, has proved completely invaluable, um, both in Lanyard and um, in our work at Eventbrite, to the point that I wouldn't consider starting a new web application without having this baked in. And that's uh, something called feature flags. So, what feature flags are, uh, they're a very simple technique that allow you to expose individual features of your site to a controlled subset of your user base. So rather than every user getting exactly the same set of functionality, you can use feature flags to say, this feature here is only visible to staff users, or it's only visible to our alpha testers, or it's only visible to, um, to our paying customers or specific, or specific users who we've handpicked. And this allows you to do all sorts of things. Firstly, it means that when you're developing new features, you don't have to have long-lived feature branches branches in version control. You can merge all of your features onto, uh, into your master branch as soon as you've, you've got a feature flag in there to, to hide them. So you can have a production site with a whole bunch of unfinished features that you're still trialing and that are all in the code base but aren't visible to, to the wrong people. Um, this also means that you can decouple the deployment of your site from release. So I, if, if if you're, if you're pushing out new features, there's always the risk that you've screwed something up and everything and everything's gone ho going to go horribly wrong. And when that happens, you really want to be able to roll back. Um, if you're just deploying by pushing code live to your server, and then when you roll back, you have to like reverse whatever you've just done. That's not really a, a very sort of safe way of operating. If you have feature flags, you can deploy the feature. The, 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 you, I can deploy a feature yesterday with a plan to launch it at 10 o'clock this morning. When I launch the feature, I just toggle the feature flag to say, OK, everyone can access this now. And if it doesn't work, if there's a spike in errors or something, I can turn it straight back off again. So it takes all of the stress out of rolling out new features. And just for that alone, it's worth, um, it's worth having that available. Um, now, at Lanyard, we wrote our own feature flag system. Um, it wasn't very hard. It took like a half day to put in place at the first, and then we maintained it over time. Um, but there's, there are actually some very good open source solutions to this as well. Um, at Eventbrite, we use Gargoyle, uh, which is a open source feature flag mechanism for Django that was released by Discus, the online commenting system. They've actually got a newer version, a, a replacement out called Gutter, but the user interface for Gutter isn't quite in the same place yet, so we're 
we, we haven't switched over to it. And so what Gargoyle gives you is it gives you very simple um, code mechanisms for adding feature flags, putting in checks that say if the user has this feature flag, do this. And it also gives you a built-in uh, UI for setting these things up. So once you've got this management UI, you can do things like say, let's, let's turn this feature on for 10% of our user base based on their IP address or their, their um, user cookie. Or you can say, let's turn this feature on for our staff users or um, people in Germany. And actually, I, um, I looked through the list of feature flags we have at Eventbrite, and there's a whole bunch of different conditions that we use turning features on and off. That we use individual users, and if somebody's Eventbrite staff, um, we can also turn them on for specific events, if there's a feature we want to try out for, for one of the events on the site, um, or specific event organizers. The, um, the Eventbrite API can feature flag by API key, so we can have features which uh, we're building for specific partners, or which are still experimental, that we can turn on just for them. Uh, we also feature flag by country based on geo IP lookups, uh, by IP ranges, so we can flag things just for the Eventbrite uh, office. And we can also do things for our different um, TLDs, .com versus .de and so forth. And again, the joy of, um, the joy of using some software that somebody else designed is that you don't have to write very much code to get this stuff up and running. So this is um, copied and pasted directly out of the Eventbrite source code. This is uh, the definition of our feature flag condition for serving things up by country. So what this... Um, so Essentially, we, 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 we said we want the capability to turn features on and off based on the user's country. And this tiny little, this bit of code here defines a new condition set, says this is going to have a string, a um, field called country that you can set in the UI, so that'll give us a, a box we can type the name of a country into. Um, it's only valid if you're checking against an HTTP request, so this feature flag doesn't work against API keys because those aren't attached to an individual country. Um, and when we, when we need to check if the feature flag ma matches, uh, we, all we do that by looking up the country field on the request object. So that's a field that's been populated by a piece of GOIP middleware earlier on. Um, but given those few lines, you register it with Gargoyle, and that now gives you the ability in that UI to say, I want to, I want to turn this feature on for, this, um, for, for a specific country. It means that all of your existing feature flag checks now gain that ability to be gated based on the user's country as well as all of the other um, conditions. So this is a trick that we used at Lanyard, um, which, again, is based around feature flags and proved incredibly valuable. And that's to have a read-only mode for the site. So Lanyard is a, essentially a sort of um, structured Wikipedia for conference information. So, it's a, so we have data on tens of thousands of conferences going on. And, this, and people sign in, and they add speakers, and they add new events that are happening, and so on. But even if you turn it into read-only mode so people can't modify it, it's still useful. You know, you can use it to find conferences and to search and to, and to, to access that source of information. And what we realized is that because the site's still useful when it's read-only, we could use this as a maintenance trick. We can, um, we can turn on a feature flag that puts the site in read-only mode, and that gives us all sorts of flexibility to do things under the hood. And so actually, one of the... One of the and the reason it's, this, this gives you flexibility is that once a site's in read-only mode and isn't changing, you can copy the database to other places, you can make large-scale modifications, you can spin up an entirely new version of the site on a separate set of servers, and then switch the load balance over to that new, to that new site once it's ready. So at Lanyard, we, the, the sort of best example of us using that was uh, a couple of years ago when we decided that we wanted to move the site from MySQL to Postgres, so actually change the d relational database we were using. And we also wanted to move from running on Amazon's EC2 to running on physical servers on software. And we combined these changes together because Postgres is a lot happier on, on physical hardware, especially when we had SSDs and things um, plugged into that. Now, because we had read-only mode, we managed to make this transition, which took um, I think it took an hour and a half to copy the data across into the new servers without any visible downtime on the site. As far as our users were concerned, Lanyard switched into read-only mode so they couldn't sign in, and then an hour and a half later it switched back out again and, every and everything was exactly as it was before. Whereas under the hood, we were now serving it from a different data center, a different database, a total, total um, dump and restore and conversion of everything that was going on under the hood. 
And the way this works is actually really simple. When the read-only mo only mode feature flag is turned on, we do essentially two things. The first, the first thing we do is we start ignoring cookies. So normally when a user hits lanyard, we look at their cookie, and a piece of middleware says, OK, they're logged in and sets up a few um, request properties and so on. Uh, when the feature flag's on, we just ignore their cookie entirely. We behave as if they're signed out. And secondly, we... Um, uh, stick that banner at the top of the page, and we hide the link to sign in. And I think we had a banner on the sign in page as well. So if you manage to get there, it would tell you that you can't sign in at the moment. And the, the, then the third thing was that our mobile APIs that um, power our iPhone and Android apps also start ignoring that user token and behaving as if the user was an anonymous signed out user as well. But this ended up being about 30 lines of code in the, in the code base, and it gave us that flexibility to throw the site into read-only mode and make giant changes under the hood without having to go offline. Um, the, last tech, the, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, these are tools for understanding what your site's actually doing. Um, there's a, the Django has sort of suffers from this thing where when you're in development mode on your laptop, there are all sorts of fantastic tools you can use. There's the Django Debug Toolbar, which gives you this x-ray vision into what's happening. Uh, you've got log files. You can fire up the, bit, the debugger. And then when you go live, all of that stuff goes away, which is a problem because on large sites, the really interesting bugs only actually happen in production. So these are two of the tools that we use, both at um, Lanyard and at Eventbrite, to get a better idea for what's happening. Uh, StatsD and Graphite come as a pair. They're, they were um, released by Etsy, uh, who have some fantastic open source software for handling large-scale sites. And what they let you do is um, draw graphs of pretty much anything you can imagine about your application. And graphs, it turns out, are uh, absolutely the best way to get a visualization of the health of how you're it's much easier to look at a graph and see something ticking down or something getting upset somewhere in your stack than to try and figure it out from log files and alert messages. And these are some of the lanyard graphs that we generate using StatsD. Um, so what stats, the way StatsD works is kind of clever. It's a tiny little piece of software that you run on your web servers, and it Essentially, let, and you can then your your web application code can then talk to it over a UDP connection. So you send it stats like counters or how long something took, and StatsD sits there aggregating the stuff. And then every 10 seconds, it forwards it onto Graphite, which can do the graph generation and 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 be a permanent home for that information. Because it's talking over UDP, if StatsD falls over, it doesn't matter. Your web application will keep on ticking over, and those um, sort of statistical packets will just get lost. Uh, then Graphite gives you uh, tools to dynamically generate graphs and build dashboards and so on as well. And so this is one of the graphs that we generate for Lanyard. This is a combined breakdown of how long our individual HTTP requests are taking to serve. And the different colors are different parts of that request cycle. So the, uh, I can't tell, is that showing up as pink? It's showing up as orange on my screen. So that chunk there is, uh, is time spent in SQL. Uh, we measure it, we wrap a timer around all of our SQL calls. Um, the rest of it is mostly time spent just in the CPU, but we also have time spent talking to Solar, time spent talking to Redis, time spent, sp spent talking to Memcached in there as well. And we can then plot those on this on this on this graph, show, which gives us an idea of the of how well the site is doing in real time, uh, based on based on how long requests are taking. When we do a deploy, the deploy is plotted on the graph as a big green horizontal line. So we can then see, okay, well we deployed the site an hour ago, and the SQL usage has gone down, or the cache usage has gone up. So it gives you an idea of how changes you make to the site affect the actual run the, the actual running of it. So. That's been a whistle-stop tour of the, the pieces of Lanyard and Eventbrite, which, which I would keep and would use on, 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 on future projects. But more importantly, these are the things that I feel give, give me new capabilities. They allow me to build software faster and quicker and with more interesting features than if I wasn't using them. And so I've pulled up, this is the, uh, that Lanyard architecture diagram, um, highlighting the individual bits that we've talked about today. Um, so... A lot of this, though, comes down to learning how to tame your inner magpie. Um, as I said earlier, at Lanyard, we, we, I went a little bit overboard on some of this stuff. At one point, we were running three data stores, two full-text search engines, uh, at least two caching layers. And 
you know, not, not, all of the, not, not, not all of that turn, turns out to be a good idea. So the one-in-one one-out strategy we used at Lanyard worked very well. I have a friend who became CTO of a, uh, a, uh, a company a few years ago who went a step further and arrived and said, you know what, we're using three data stores, four different programming languages, total insanity. From now on, we will build all of our software using PHP and MySQL and Solar and, if your quest and, and Memcached. And if your question is, what am I going to build this in? The answer is one of those four things. So you can, and, and you know, that helped them massively simplify their stack and, and get their productivity back on, back on the road. So you can go too far with this stuff, but at the same time, I'm pretty confident that... Um, at least the things that I've talked about today uh, are a very worthy addition to any, um, any web application stack and will help you build things smarter and faster with, and, and get better, better results with, with a small team. Um, I should mention I work for Eventbrite. We are hiring. We've actually just opened an engineering office in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so let's hope that's probably closer than San Francisco for people out here, although it's still an eight-hour drive, right? Um, but yeah, so we're very keen on if, if any of this stuff looked interesting to you and you're a Python programmer or Android or iOS or machine learning data science, we'd love to talk to you. Come and uh, find me later on. And I've left uh, 10 minutes for questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Sure. Um, so the question there was, how come we've got Nginx and Varnish when Nginx has caching built in? Um, to be honest, I haven't played with Nginx's built-in caching stuff that much. I know that the micro-caching um, thing I described earlier has definitely been achieved with, with Nginx. Uh, generally, I trust Varnish a lot. You know, Varnish, the numbers you get out of Varnish are completely crazy. Uh, I've got a lot... Um, I've, I've had a lot of really good experiences with it, and it seems to work well. But yeah, if you, if you wanted to, to use Nginx as your exclusive front-level le front cache, that would be, if that worked, work, if that, that would definitely be worth investigating. Actually, while we're on this slide, um, I, I, I'm, I'll, I can talk to why we do things in this order as well. Um, so we actually have Nginx, Varnish, and HAProxy running. Uh, we do it in this order is varnish is fantastic but it's not really great at logging and what you don't want is like half of if half of your user traffic hits varnish and gets served without ending up in a log file somewhere then you don't know that those people visited at all so we use nginx for three things um firstly it logs so every request that hits our stack gets logged in in the same log file secondly it's it does ssl termination which is something that varnish doesn't have and never will have um there's a very opinionated essay by the Varnish maintainer about why it's insane to try and bake SSL into something, something like that. Uh, and then finally, Nginx also sets a tracking cookie purely for our log files. Um, again, because Varnish is ignoring all of these cookies. Um, so if we want, if we want to mark, put a cookie on, uh, if we want to put a cookie on each request in the log file, we need to do it at the Nginx level. Um, Varnish does caching and sits in front of everything so that. Uh, so uh, we did originally have Varnish in front of bo uh, both of our front-end machines, but that meant that your cache rate is knocked in half because you've got, um, you've got traffic being load balanced across two places. And then HAProxy, we use as the load balancer because it's really good at load balancing. Again, um, Nginx has load balancing, Varnish has load balancing. You could probably crush that entire pile down just to Nginx if you wanted to get creative with, with, your, with your web server. Um, so we use it for both. Like post, 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 uh, so the question was, um, Postgres in the architecture, are we using it just for, just for transactions, or are we using it um, as a full-blown relational store? Oh, do we rely on transactions in our application code? So yeah, we, um, we, we rely, so 
we rely on Postgres. We, we use database transactions extensively because the great thing about having a relational database is that there's 30 years of computer science backing up, like, ensuring that your data stays um, consistent and, and you have good data integrity and so on. So I'm a huge fan of relational databases in general. Um, you know, I, we, we, MongoDB was one of the many things in the, that was temporarily in the lanyard stack and we then pulled back out. Um, we pulled back out. Uh, in particular, so we use Postgres very traditionally. Um, there are a few reasons that, that, there are a couple of other reasons that we moved to Postgres over MySQL. The most important of those is that um, Postgres can do schema alterations. You can actually change your tables um, and add columns to them. In MySQL, once you get over a million or so rows in a table, um, adding a column to that table locks the table and it can take down your entire website for the duration of the, of the migration, which is not great. And you actually see a lot of places where people deliberately make poor design choices in their schema because that's the only way they can avoid adding a column to a 10 million row MySQL table. So that's been the single biggest advantage we got from Postgres is that we could, it made it possible for us to add columns to our database without, um, without taking the site down. A question right at the back. So where does Kafka fit into this? I, I, I cheated on the Q&A and, and put up uh, a few prompts. So Kafka is, I, I'm not using Kafka for anything at the moment. Um, I'm really fascinated by it. So Kafka is a piece of software that LinkedIn released a few years ago. And it's essentially a, it's a highly reliable message bus. So the idea is that Kafka is something which you can write messages to um, it creates this, this append-only log file of stuff that has happened. So an order has been placed, a user signed in, anything that you like you can put in there. And you can then subscribe to it. So you can have things that run off the Kafka queue. Um, and so in many ways, it's similar to Celery and Redis. But the big difference is that whereas most message queues have messages flying around in the ether and being like sent over TCP and so, so on, Kafka is an append-only log file on disk. In fact, it's on multiple disks. You can set it up so that when something happens, Kafka won't, uh, won't treat that as committed until it's been written onto at least two or three hard drives on different machines. And because it's static on disk, it means the things that... Um, the, the things that uh, that listen on that queue uh, can replay themselves. They can roll. They can start at a certain point. They can play forward. If something goes wrong, they can rewind. They can rewind to yesterday if they need to replay a full day's worth of transactions. So it means you can buy, build incredibly reliable software on top of a rock solid sequence of interesting events that happened. And this is, has obvious applications when you think about something like Eventbrite where we're dealing with um, somebody buying a ticket which has a whole bunch of things that need to happen. Not just um, like emailing their, their receipt and updating account balances and so on, but also things like invalidating caches or updating our back-end analytics databases. So. We're not using it yet. Um, I think it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of very cool stuff you can do with it. At the same time, it's super complicated, and it's not something you'd want to bake into every, any, any web application going. Uh, question there. That's a very good question. I don't know yet. I haven't quite got The question was, if I choose to use Kafka, what are they going to make me remove? Um, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't got to that point in the conversation yet. It's a very good question. Um, so we're using Python 2 at both Lanyard and Eventbrite because they're old, older code bases and porting to Python 3 when you've got tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of code is enough pain that we haven't gone through it yet. Um, I believe everything that I've shown you is now com Python 3 compatible. So I, I don't really have a horse in that race either way, but, um, but there's no reason you wouldn't be able to use this stuff with Python 3. Absolutely, yeah. A very important thing. So the downside of feature flags is that you get a, an explosion in potential pathways through your code. There are dozens and dozens of different potential combinations of flags. So it's very important that once you've shipped a feature and you know that you're not going to roll it back, you go back and, and delete the code um, that, that dealt with that feature flag. Um, we're, at Eventbrite, we're very good at that. Lanyard still has quite a few knocking around that we haven't cleaned up yet. Uh, 
Um, so do I have any best practices for incorporating StatsD and Graphite into my stack? Well, there is one, so one, so they're really fun to get started with. There is the, one of the downsides is that once you start recording a particular metric, it's very difficult to stop. You can stop recording it, but it'll still stick around. And so the first times, um, the first time we, we used it at Lanyard, we put thousands of metrics in there. We were like, ah, we'll have a hit counter for every conference page and so on. And that was a fiasco. We ended up, um, there is a limit in, the StatsD scales fantastically well, but it doesn't scale well with tens of thousands of metrics being collected at once. So, be a little bit cautious about the number of metrics that you're collecting. Um, but, you know, in terms of if, you, if you've got a few hundred metrics and you're writing to them tens of thousands a second, that works fine. And I can take one last question before we get turfed out of the room, I think. Great. Well, um, thank you very much for listening. And I'll be hanging around outside if you want to talk to me about any of this.